that um, we are not to see as the world sees. You know, because quite often the world misjudges where God is. And that's because the heart of man is deceitful and desperately wicked. Because so many people's hearts want to continue in perversity and in darkness. They miss where God is. Can you imagine if you lived in the time that the children of Israel were in captivity in Egypt? Would you have thought that they were God's people? They were the ones that were oppressed. They were the ones that didn't seem to have much going on for them. They were the ones who carried the burden. They were the butt of the society. You would have thought that maybe God was with the pharaohs, the ones who had the gold and the silver. You would have thought that maybe God was with the ones who seemed to have the best things of life, who seemed to dwell in safety, who seemed to be surrounded by fences that are made of the most beautiful hewn stones. But the reality of it is this, the ones that God was with did not look like they had God on their side. And it's not even a coincidence because we know that God is an invisible God. And so you don't have to see him. You only experience him by connecting with his benevolence by faith. As I want to encourage you, regardless of how much the world has told us what it means to be what, let us be reminded that we are what and who God says we are. Praise the Lord. You know, because it's important for us to be reminded of these things, it is very critical for us to not forget that even though we are in this world, we are not of this world. What does it mean to not be of this world? It means to not live one's life by the judgment and the standards of this world. You know, like I told us many times before, that we have come to the seventh church that is called the church of Laodicea, which means the church of the judgment of the people. Many people that we see today live their lives in such a way as to receive the commendations of men. They live their lives in such a way as to be found worthy of commendation by those who are in the world. You know that even a while ago in the body of Christ, we had musicians and singers and, 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 and speakers who came in straight out of the quarters of Satan to create a new standard in the body of Christ. And they seem to have been accepted and received hook, line, as sinker, as the standard for worship and the standard for speaking. But that was why we were asleep. You know, the parable of the wheat and the tears states, it, it stipulates that while men were asleep, the enemy came and he sowed tears. That was when they were asleep. It begins with us recognizing that there was a time that we were indeed asleep. There are certain things that the enemy cannot do amongst us now because we are awake. Even look at us in this community of faith at Communion House. There are certain things that had happened to us, many a blow that we had suffered simply because we were asleep. But you know, there are things now that cannot just go on because we have our eyes peeled and we have our watchmen servicing the towers, honoring the Lord and fulfilling their calling. You see, while we were asleep, these messengers of Satan who disguised themselves as angels of light, they came and they told us how we should sing. They, show, they told us how we should dress. They told us what a good preaching is. And we received and accepted the standards that they brought to the point of losing many moves of God. And when I say we lost out on many moves of God, is because the faithfulness of God is such that God continues to do what he says he will do. He continues to be himself, but we kept looking the other way simply because many of us could not go to John for baptism because he was dressed in camel's clothing and he ate locust. But we have been told that we needed to find the ones who were dressed in linen. And Jesus came and he says, the ones who are well-dressed, they are in king's palaces. But this is the voice of him crying in the wilderness, preparing the way for the kingdom to come. And so one of the things that we have learned is not to keep looking for what the word says we should look for. I mean, we can't take instructions from the dead, can we? Or maybe we shouldn't, even though we have in the past. You know, these are some of the things that I am hearing of late 
And I inquired of the Lord. I said, why do I hear these things? And the Lord opened my eyes and he says, look at them. They are full of scorn. And they are full of ridicule. It's interesting that my wife will share that testimony about the lady who kept looking at the man who was praising God with disdain because she felt if God is that good. Why hasn't he done this and done that? God said, look at them. And I saw them in the corner and they were looking at us with disdain. They were looking at us as though we do not know what we do. I said, okay, I get it. I, I get that we don't look like they expect us to look but on the grand scheme of things, what is that to you? Because we need to learn how to seek what's in the heart of the Father. You know, because we're all, most of our upbringing in the church was about using God to get what we want. As opposed to learning how to understand what's in the heart of the Father. You know, David was called a man after God's own heart. And that is the reason why he was so beloved of God that God would even call his own son the son of David. So it is critical for us to know what's in the heart of the father. And so I inquired, I said, Lord, what is in your heart? And then he took me to Nehemiah. So I want you to come with me to Nehemiah chapter 7. The book of Nehemiah, chapter 7. We're going to start reading from verse 1. The Bible says, Then it was when the wall was built, and I had hung the doors, when the gatekeepers, the singers, and the Levites had been appointed. After what? The walls were built. He said, I hung the doors. Then the gatekeepers and the singers and the Levites were appointed. Let's keep reading. It says that I gave the charge of Jerusalem to my brother Hanani and Hananiah, the leader of the citadel. For he was a faithful man and feared God more than many. And I said to them, do not let the gates of Jerusalem be open until the sun is hot. And while they stay in guard, let them shut and bar the doors. And appoint guards from among the inhabitants of Jerusalem, one at his watch station and another in front of his own house. You see, the ones who were in the corner ridiculing us as we begin to take position are there to let us know that we have taken position. The heart of the father is such that the father wants for you to be confident in the place where he has appointed you. And the Bible says that the things of, of God are foolishness to those who are without. Just because of time, I'm going to tell you what had happened to Nehemiah and the guys who decided to respond in obedience to the call to rebuild Jerusalem. The Bible says that when they started, some evil men came together and started to ridicule them and said even if they had 50,000 people, if they had more people and more resources, it is impossible for them to complete what they're doing. Because by the standards of man, the approach that they took by the leading of God would not get the job done. By the standard of men, it was impossible. And so what do people do? When they see that what you're doing is not in alignment with what they expect, they are not curious enough to come and find out what you do, why you do what you do. They, by default, resolve to what? To ridicule. That is what they do. But it is to your advantage and to mine. You know, I started telling us last week that there are times wherein when we, you see, I don't want to re-preach that message, but I want to draw a point. Where we stand is where we have been appointed to stand. 
If we are waiting for the world to applaud us and to celebrate us, then we are seeking our reward where there is none. So what do we do if we know that powerful truth? I hate to do this, but ma'am, if you don't mind, maybe we can have him be in the nursery for a little bit. Just because even myself, I am getting caught in his activity. But the truth of the matter is this. The things of God, as the Bible says, are foolishness to those who are without. They are outside. We are inside, taking our places, and that is the reason why they choose to look at us with disdain so that by their disapproval, we can recognize that we have God's approval. Because friendship with the world is enmity against God. If the world approves of you, if the world approves of you, you need to check yourself. You know, maybe Alan can help us with the air conditioning. I think someone turned the heating on in this place. It's really hot. Yeah, so if you can, yeah, because I want to know the difference between the fire of the Holy Spirit <laughs> and bad air conditioning. So that we're not saying, can you feel the fire? And the reality is just the heat. So let us know the difference. If it's cold in here and I'm still sweating, then we know what is really going on. You see, last week we started talking about the fact that we cannot, for no reason at all, succumb to the approval of the world. It is a very dangerous thing. Now, I know some people are like, Oh, if we are not able to mingle with the world, how do we then change them? You know, people are saying, in fact, someone said to me recently, he said, if all of us in the body of Christ follow the things that you say, this was about four or five days ago, just a couple of days ago, he said, if every one of us follow what things you're saying, he said, we will completely be seen as outsiders by the ones who are still outside of the faith. I said, yeah, yeah absolutely. I said, that's my plan. I said, that's the plan. I said, because that's what God wants. And he was like, but if, if we're seen as outsiders, if they don't want to have anything to do with us, how are we able to then influence them for Jesus? I said, that's a very good question. I said, let me ask you, was Jesus and the apostles seen as one with the world? They were not seen as one with the world. They knew that Jesus was different. They knew that the apostles were different. It is part of the deception of the enemy that got us to where we're at, wherein we think, okay, let me even ask you a simple question. How is it working for us? All of the blending into the world, singing the songs that the world sings, sometimes changing the lyrics, but still using the beat. How is it working for us? You understand what I'm saying? The other day I saw a lady that claims to be a Christian rapper and she had a big chain across her neck, you know, a big pendant with her name written on it. And she was there and she was like doing this. And I'm like, I have to listen closely to know that this one is trying to preach the gospel. But she has taken on the appearance of the children of the world. And I'm like, if we need the appearance of the children of the world to bring the gospel, then we don't have a gospel. Jesus says, you are light, you are salt. You see, I'm going to say this, and you're, you're, you will like it, but some people will not like it. The moment we started to try to make people feel comfortable, we attempted to replace the Holy Spirit. It's that simple. The moment the church decided, oh, we're going to play circular music so that we give people kind of like a transition. We missed it. You know, there are churches where before service starts, they kind of play circular music just so that unbelievers that are coming in, they call it um, seeker friendly, you know, so that when they come in, they can feel comfortable. But it is impossible for you to make people comfortable by burning incense that has been offered to bear 
and shortly afterwards transition them to come to the foot of the cross. Jesus says, why do you seek the living among the dead? Come unto me, all you who are labored and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. True repentance begins with you showing the readiness to leave where you're at to where you need to be. If we stand as we should as light and salt, Gentiles, the Bible says, will come to our light. This concept of masquerading the light so that we can sneak it into the camp of the enemy is false gospel because that is not what was prophesied over the church, over the ecclesia. The ecclesia is who we are. The word ecclesia means the ones that have been called out and made separate. We were not called the church. The translators who tried to control the narrative called, they replaced the word ecclesia. I cannot say that enough. The word church means house. They wanted to turn us into house slaves so that we can do everything they want. We're supposed to stand out and look different. We're supposed to sound different. I'm not supposed to speak and then you will not even know that I'm a believer because every other word is a swear word. And people say, well, that is how you, you, you function as an undercover agent. No, Jesus says, do not be an undercover agent. He says, nobody lights a lamp and puts it under a bushel. Why do you want to cover the light? Let it be seen. Who can handle it will come to it. Arise, shine. That's what the Bible says. Your light is come. Gentiles will come to your light and kings to the brightness of your shining. I remember many years ago, somebody saw a vision concerning me. He said, I see God raising you in America to the point wherein they invited you to the White House. I told my wife, I said, that wasn't me. This was like in 2014. I said, so the Lord will be with me so much that they would ask me to come. No, 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 I'm not in a hurry. It might take 15, 20 years. It doesn't matter. I will continue to wait until my light is come. The Bible did not say I will go to them. The Bible says that kings will come to the brightness of my shining. You see, we have sold ourselves cheap. Thinking that we have to go to them. Let me tell you something. Even they go to places that you will not believe in search of what you already have. There are people in places of authority, in positions of power, who go ahead to bow and bend their knee at shrines that they may obtain some kind of favor that has a spiritual edge. <laughs> but again, you know, it's okay. We, we were asleep. But now we're waking up. You know, because there's a way the devil packages himself. The Bible says Satan will disguise himself as an angel of light and so will his messengers. And let's not forget for a second, those boys are operating with power that God gave to them. For the Bible says power was given to the dragon to deceive the nations. The Bible says don't be ignorant of the devices of Satan. Don't be ignorant because they're not, they're not just making these things up. They're working with power that was given to them. And so what are you supposed to do? Work with the power that has been given to you. That is how this thing will remain what God intends for it to be. Light shining with the darkness not being able to comprehend. But God allows for the darkness to even have a chance too. If he would give power to the dragon to deceive the nations, do you now think he will not fulfill the promise that he made to put a seal upon you so that the destruction of the ages will not come to you? We need to be very confident in the God that we serve and in his word that he has given to us so that we are not found on the streets running helter-skelter, looking to seek refuge under Pharaoh, the one who cannot even look the angel of death in the eye. <laughs> These men took their places upon the tower. They hung the doors. They're like, you know what? We need to make sure that there is a distinction between us and them. They commissioned the Levites to even show further consecration unto the Lord. And they assigned the watchmen unto the towers. And when they did that, people ridiculed them. 
And God was like, that is it. Man's disapproval of you is usually signaling God's approval of you. I am not talking about you being disapproved by everybody. They disapprove of you at work because you're always late and you don't do a good job. That's not what I'm talking about. Let's, let's be clear. You understand what I mean? Yeah, I'm talking about the world system. I'm talking about the idolatry that is in the world. I am talking about the immorality and the lust that is in the world. I'm not talking about excellence. You need to be a person of excellence. The Bible says you need to show yourself approved. I'm, I'm, I've got a, I'm clear to say this, so let's just go over it very quickly. You see, okay, I thought I did, but not yet. Come with me to Matthew chapter 7. Matthew chapter 12, sorry. Matthew chapter 12, and we're going to look at verse 7. The Bible says, but if you had known what this means, I desire mercy and not sacrifice, you would not have condemned the guiltless. This is an introduction by Jesus himself of heaven's legal system, right? Jesus says, if you know what it means, and, I, and, I, and I've said to you multiple times that this was not the first time the men were hearing it. Jesus was only reminding them of it. There was a prophet that had come prior whose name was Hosea. And Hosea said to them these same things that if you know what it means that the Lord desires mercy, you will not have what? Condemned the guiltless. Now, I want to connect a little bit of what I've just said right now to what I said on Tuesday. On Tuesday, we read from Isaiah chapter 1 verse 9, talking about the fact that the Lord himself has decided and proposed within himself to keep for us a remnant. That means in our generation, there will be a remnant. A remnant, as it should be. I just like to say remnant. It just makes it sound more powerful. But the Lord chooses to keep for himself a group of people, and he said to those people who decided to have a judgmental approach to God's plan, he said to them, Y'all are expecting for me to demand of these ones sacrifices and lit liturgies and rituals and all whatnot. He says, no, he said, I'm not looking for all of that. The reason why you're not part of them is because you want to be part of what I'm doing by your own standard. He says, I'm not looking for your sacrifice. Remember, we talked about that on, on Tuesday, that the Lord says, I'm not looking for your sa sacrifice. I have chosen to be the shield of these ones simply because their confidence is in me and not in their ability. Okay, come with me once again to this Matthew chapter 12, verse 7. And what does he say? He says, I desire mercy and not sacrifice. He says, if you know what that means, you will not what? Blame or condemn the guiltless. Now, what does it mean to be guiltless? Let me tell you a story real quick. There was a time in the nation of Israel, wherein the nation was getting further and further away from God because they were coming closer and closer under the administration of Saul. Saul was the king and his heart had departed from the Lord. This is a very familiar story to those of us sitting in this room because there are organizations, nations, and corporations that we are aware of that started at the word of the Lord. There are places that we know of that were instituted because thus saith the Lord. When Saul was appointed, God spoke to Samuel. He says, they're looking for a seer, but they don't know that I promoted you. You are now a prophet. They're asking for you to show them where the lost animals are, but I want you to prophesy and show them that they are the lost sheep. And so the Lord said to Samuel, if, I, if you are a student of prophecy, of the prophetic, I want you to take note of what I just said. I don't want it to pass you by. So there are, there are seers amongst us who have already come out. Some seers are here. They're still in the closet. They're still seeing in the closet. But don't worry, your time is coming. Because I am guaranteed one thing, that kind begets kind. And anyone that the Lord brings about this work that finds a connection to the work that the Lord is doing here at Communion House, as a prophetic component to them. They have a prophetic component to them, either in prophesying or in seeing. So if you're not yet seeing as much as some people are seeing, don't be discouraged. Because I think 
if we don't say that, some people will just kind of like gloss over it. And before the end of the service today, you're going to hear, uh, what's his name? Charles's testimony. Because Charles was one of the people that I prayed for, I think it was Saturday last week or two Saturdays ago. I, I prayed for y'all saying, if you have not been seen in a while, or if you have not been seen like you used to see, come. And he came forward and I let him tell you what happened to him just the very next day. So, okay, thank you, Holy Spirit. I knew I wasn't doing justice. He said to me, I called your attention because I want you to call them out from where they are because it's time for them to be seen. You see, this word's been lingering in my spirit for like two days and I couldn't quite tell what it was. Paul said that I may know as I am known. That was what Paul said. In fact, I was thinking recently that I would teach a series on the prayers of Paul because a lot of what he prayed, we should pray daily if we can. He says that I may know as I am known. But then a couple of days ago, we just started to bubble in my spirit that I may see as I am seen. It was so abundant in my heart that I started to say it out loud, that I may see as I am seen. And so there are people here that are connected to that word. Heaven sees you, but you don't see yet as clearly as you should. It's time for the veil to be lifted. Someone is still holding on to their veil because it was comfort to them when their face was exposed. I'm going to tell you exactly what I am seeing. You see, there was a time that you were about to be put to shame and a veil was given to you to cover your face and you have refused to remove the veil because it reminds you of comfort. It comforted you. It consoled you. It's just like you, you've heard about children who get troubled when they're little and after a while, people notice that once there's a cloth around their bed and they hold on to it, what do they call those things? Say that again? Security blanket. And that reassures them. It makes them find their footing again. Yours is a veil and it's covered your face. And that is the reason why you're not seeing what God is showing you. If you've just had a witness in your heart, I want you to lift a finger up. It doesn't matter who's looking at you or not. In fact, no one should be looking at you at this time. I want you to put your finger up. and say, Lord, I give up the veil. I give up the veil. You see, the veil was temporal. The will of God for you is for you to be radiant. David says we beheld him and became radiant and our faces were not put to shame. So once you behold him and you have become radiant, you don't need that veil anymore. You need to take off the veil that you may see. I don't want you thinking about Moses right now. Moses put on the veil because some people were getting intimidated. They were getting blinded. Wait until you get to that place wherein they tell you that your face is shining too much. He didn't put on the veil while he was still on the mountain. The Bible says he spoke to God face to face as a man speaks to his friend. Where you need the veil is not in that closet. In that closet, in your secret place, you need to have a revealed face. The Bible says we with unveiled face. Faces, behold. With a veiled face, you cannot behold. And someone is like, I can't even remember if I ever used to see. Yeah, that's because you don't even remember how long it is that you have had the veil. And I'm talking to you now and you know it. So just tell the Lord, Lord, I am ready to give up the veil. And I will begin to see. Let me tell you something. It is a guarantee because I have prayed for you. And the reason why I say it is a guarantee because I have prayed for you is because when I heard that prayer, it was an overflow of the Lord's intercession for you. And so I'm telling you that it is a guarantee that you will see as you are seen. Just drop the veil. Father, we give you praise. Hallelujah. All righty, so let's get back to the story that I wanted to tell you. In the nation of Israel, Saul became king because of the word of the Lord that came to Samuel, saying that Saul needed to be anointed king over Israel. And so everybody came under the authority of Saul, even though God had warned them. He says, you don't need a king over you because I am your king. And the last time I checked, I am enough. And the people were like, eh, nah, we want to be like the other nations. And God was like, well, let it be so. Because the other nations are struggling. They just make it look like they're happy, but they're not. 
they have been oppressed by their kings. But when you talk to them, they're like, oh, we have a king, we have a king. And as soon as you leave, they're like, oh my God, we have a king. Because God knew what those people were going through. He was like, you don't need those kings. He says, I am enough for you. But they said they wanted a king. And God knew that the moment they started to use their mouth to call one a king over them, they would come under his authority. So the people of the land have come under the authority of, of Saul. And because the origin of that throne was lost, they were lusting after the other nations. So they brought with them the standard of the nation. Now, guess what started to happen? There were men who recognized that Saul had departed from the Lord and they refused to follow him. This was, how sto this was the story of how David had an army, how God raised an army unto the Lord's beloved, unto his beloved. So the man started to disagree with the order of the nation because it was no longer the order of God. And the more Saul consolidated his throne, the more they borrowed from other nations standards for running their economy, standards for raising children, standards for doing everything, and these men were not having any of it. And guess what happened to them? They started to fall short according to the standards of the nation of Israel. And guess what? The people began to choose judgment over mercy. Don't worry, it's going to make sense because what happened there is happening in the world today. The people started to judge those guys and they found them wanting. Ha. Huh. My desire today is that you will see yourself in this picture that I am painting, which is already what's in the word of God, just reminding us of it. These men, after a while, could no longer stay in the nation. They could no longer stay amongst the people. They had to be driven away. And they were driven away to a place that is called what? Anyone remembers? It was a cave. And it's called the Cave of Adullam. How many people have ever heard that? Have you ever read in your Bible of a place called the Cave of Adullam? The Cave of Adullam is very symbolic. If anyone should learn about the Cave of Adullam, it is the believer of today. And you know why? I told you the last church, the seventh church, is called what? La Odyssea, which means the judgment or the standards of the people. What is the meaning of Adullam? Adullam means the same thing. It's just two different languages. La Odyssea is Greek. Adulam is what? Is Hebrew. Adulam means the judgment of the people. And so when the judgment of the people comes, it comes as a way for God to create a distinction between his people and other people. The Lord desires what? Mercy over judgment. If you understand that, you will not condemn the guiltless. You see, God called them guiltless because as far as heaven's standard is concerned, those men were not guilty for not being able to pay their taxes to the king. Because what they were being levied was not right before the Lord. When they needed money to do business and needed farms to cultivate, and they took land from their family and friends, they were being usurped because they were told that they needed to pay interest. Something within them did not agree with it, and they fell short of the people's standard. So what became of all those men? The Bible says when David finally got to the cave of Adullam, he found every single one of those men belonging to one of these or even all of these categories. And what were they? He said that they were debtors. They were men that were discontented. And they were men who were discomforted. Ultimately, they were all displaced men. 
When you read the account of the army of, J of, of David, what do you find? You find that the reality of it is those men were the strongest men in the land. They were the ones that were most accurate with their arrows. They were the ones who could hold on to their swords the longest. The Bible says the men in the army of David, they would hold on to their swords until their bone and the handle of the sword became one. But these men were broke and busted. And people called them all kinds of names. You know why? Because a new law and standard was introduced that was not the law of God and the hearts of these men would just not get them to compromise. Communion House, I've come to tell you today that if you haven't given God worship in recent times for his immaculate wisdom, learn to do it often. Because the plan of God is so phenomenal. The way God processes and the way he thinks. You see, Jay, the Lord wanted to call out the ones that were loyal to him. And he knew that if he had just said to them, hey, you strong men of valor, come to the cave of Adullam. The boys would have been like, eh, I don't want to leave my farm. I don't want to leave my friends. I don't want to leave my this and my that. And the Lord was like, okay, if I do it that way, you will not respond. So what I will do is I would allow for there to be a different system that is very apparent and a people that are very determined. And by so doing, they will force you out. And that was what happened to those men. They were displaced. They became the rejected stones that Isaiah prophesied about in Isaiah 45, that the Lord is coming and he will build for himself yet again from the stones that have been cast off the brooks, that have been cast outside of Kidron. These stones have been rejected, but they are the ones that the Lord wants to use. And that was exactly the reason why they no longer measured up by the standard of the world. Now, let me remind you of something or maybe, maybe make something clear to you. I said it at the beginning, but I didn't make it as clear. We as children of God, we don't always say that, oh, we want to be like the world. No, we didn't set out to be like the world. We just wanted something that we could manage. And so Satan saw that and was like, okay, if I kept all these things in the world, they wouldn't come to it because it's too extreme. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to bring a little bit of it and put it in their midst. And by so doing, they will be in the world without knowing they are in the world. So the children of Israel were following the standards of the other kings that were idolaters but they didn't know because the orders were coming from Saul, the one that was anointed to be over them. So the body of Christ suffered the same thing, which is a shame because it was been written down for thousands of years. We shouldn't have repeated the same mistake, but because we were asleep, we stumbled into it. We, we were sleepwalking right into this one. We did. We slept walk into it or sleepwalked, whichever of those two is correct. We walked into it. The songs, the preachings, the books, everything came to us from the anointed ones. And that is the reason why we didn't know because if Satan sends you a demon that has four horns and two tails split at the end to become four, you would have been speaking in tongues and casting him out. So what do you do? He sends you angels of light. He's messengers who look like angels of light. You see, the Lord said to me today, he says, I am sending you into the water today for a call to repentance. For the hearts of many need to change before the heavens open. It's a very painful process. If, 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 in fact, to me, as I am doing it, I, I feel the pain of having to go through this process of getting us to renounce the things that we picked up along the way. Some of the things that we have approved of without even knowing. So you come to a place wherein the Lord has put his name and you keep saying, mm, at my church, they don't do that. If I was the one running things here, I wouldn't do this. But the Lord is like, if you keep pointing at things that you don't approve of, you will miss what I have already approved of. 
Because you have to come in mercy, not in judgment. Otherwise, you will continue to condemn the guiltless. Before God, we are guiltless, even though to the world we are falling short. I'm going to speak to people in here today that one day the Lord is going to raise you up. He's raising you up already to start a meeting at your house, to, to lead a meeting somewhere, maybe in a break room at work. I, I, I speak to you all today that you would receive the wisdom in that which I am saying so that you do not pick up a burden that is heavy and come under a yoke that is tough. Jesus says, my burden is light and my yoke is easy. And the reason why I'm saying that is because there are so many people. This was what the Lord told me in the year 2017 into 2018. He showed me a couple of people that I was doing life with. He said, I called this one, I called that one. But when I called this one, he looked at all of what all the other ministers and churches around him were doing. And he said, there's no way I can do all of that. And he went back again into hiding. He said, but I never asked him to do none of that. He said, but in his heart, he had come to believe that that was the standard. He said, but that isn't my standard. And so when the Lord showed that to me, many people, I was like, even this one? In fact, there was one of them. I couldn't hold myself. I went to meet him. I said, there's a call of God on your life. He was like, I know. He said, but it's really tough stepping out to do these things. The Holy Spirit was like, did I not tell you? And so the Lord is getting you ready to take on more in his name. And he doesn't want you to disqualify yourself by saying, no, I can't do it that way. I can't sing like that. I don't have, you know, stage presence like that. I'm not, a, I'm not an orator like that. But the reality of it is those things are not required here. We just need obedience. Jesus, look at those fishermen who never went to school. They didn't even know how to spell their own names. He was like, don't worry about what you will say. He says, when they call you to speak, open your mouth and I will fill it because I don't need your words. You, I am the word and you have me. Open your mouth and I will fill it. And that is the reason why the Bible says the holy man of old spoke as the Holy Spirit gave them utterance. Many of us, when we started communion house, we had Danny who played the guitar. Many people were like, oh, oh, you need to be able to do this and do that. And I said, no, not really. Because... This is what the Lord has shown us to do for now and we're going to do it and the power of God was with us. And so I tell you this, folks. The world will come and condemn you because you don't measure to their standard. This particular generation is weaponized to judge everything you do. Everything you say, have you tried commenting on someone's post lately? Some people, you can't even say happy birthday because they would ask if there's anything happy about a birthday. You know, all kinds of craziness is going on. And it wasn't like that. And it's not because of the Republicans or the Democrats. It is because of the fulfillment of prophecy. It's because God loves you so much and he doesn't want you to be lost in the crowd. That is the reason why he created the order of distinction. So that when the time comes for the reapers to come into the field, they will know the wheat from the tears. When the Lord was preparing his beloved, David. David means the beloved of God. When God was preparing his beloved, that's why a lot of prophecies about Jesus had to come through David because it was someone who had internalized the truth about being the Lord's beloved. And that is the reason why he says the Lord will not allow his holy one to see corruption. Neither will he leave my soul in Hades. He thought he was speaking of himself, but he prophesied of the Lord Jesus. So when the Lord was preparing David as an emblem or as an example of who the Lord Jesus would be, he needed to raise an army that would follow him. And so what did he do? He created that distinction in the nation of Israel. And these men were called discomforted, discontented, and debtors. The three Ds, and I had a fourth one today, displaced. They were displaced from the wrong place and repositioned in the right place. But this is the reason why you're not excited. Mary Ann. The reason why we are not excited to hear things like this is because of the fact that Adulam is not a five-star hotel. It's not a resort. Adulam is a cave. And that is the reason why 
even though we know what God is doing in our subconscious mind, we wrestle with it because of the fact that there are certain comforts that we had become accustomed to and we don't want to give them up. The children of Israel knew that God was indeed going to meet with them at Sinai, but Sinai was not in an oasis. It was in the wilderness. And they missed so dearly the pleasures of Egypt. If you're watching this, and this is the first message in this series that you're listening to, I want to encourage you, go to the Tuesday before just today, which is September 5th, 6th. So 9th, 6th. Go and watch that because certain foundations were laid in that message that will help you to understand what I am saying here today. You see, because the reality of it is that God is saying, this is what I am doing. And because it is what the Lord is doing, I have no choice. It has to be what I am saying. And then to you, how do you receive it? It has to be what you're thinking. You need to start to think and program yourself to the point where you're like, okay, God, whatever it is that you need, I want to say yes before I figure out how. These men were broke. They had nothing. And they went into a cave. And if, you've ever, if you know anything about strong men, they're usually the ones with the most voracious appetite. They can eat. Strong men, but nothing to do, nothing to eat. They were so hungry that when David saw them, David could no longer remain in the cave with them. He took them. He says, we have to go and find food. You remember the story? He took maybe thousands of men or hundreds how many people remember the total number of them? Eventually, I think there were about 700 men. Eventually. Anyway, no, there were more than 700. 700 of them were, were archers, and there was another 500 who were swordsmen, something like that. But so there were over 1,000 men, and he took them, and he says, if I left you here, you won't make it. Because of how hungry they were. He took them to the temple. When they got to the temple, the priest that was in the temple said, there's no food for all of these men except for the one that has been consecrated to the Lord. And David was like, you have bread that is consecrated to the Lord? He says, look at these men. Themselves are consecrated to the Lord. Their suffering is the emblem of their consecration. The ridicule is the emblem of their consecration. He then asked the priest, he says, will you forbid that men who have gone through these things Will you forbid them from eating that which is the Lord's? And the priest was like, who am I? He says, let them eat. Huh. I'm going to, I think we're going to continue this on Tuesday. Because there is a lot that I am just skimming over. That's because this is kind of like a preamble to more. But let me just quickly go over what I just said. You see, the judgment that they have passed on us and that they are about to pass over us is what qualifies us for the Lord's bread. The suffering of these present times, Paul says, is intended. He said it's actually nothing compared to the glory that shall be revealed. But without the suffering, without the consecration, and without the mark of the cave of Adullam, when Paul says, I bury my body, the marks of the Lord Jesus, he was talking about the kind of marks that was on the body of the men who were in the cave of Adullam. Because the cave of Adullam was such that they could not go in and out without being bruised. And so when they stood at the altar, he was like, can you not see? They've gone through all of that so that they can partake of the bread. I tell you one thing, that bread is symbolic of glory. And that is the reason why Jesus says it is only those who have overcome that will receive a crown. Many of us are falling for the lie of the enemy and for the deception that if you are a child of God, everything should be easy for you. You know, it's one of the greatest deceptions that has come into the church that, oh, if that thing is not working, then that means it's not of God. Was Isaac of God or not? But when Abraham received the promise, in the first five years, was he working? In the first 10 years, was it working? 20 years, was he working? He was called when he was about 54 years old. But he didn't receive the promise until he was 100. Now, if that was you and I, would we not have given up? The church today would tell you, give up. It's not working because you have nothing to show for it. <clears throat> but I have something to show for it. 
You see, the fact that you think I don't have anything to show for it and you say it out is you condemning the guiltless. That is my evidence, number one. My evidence, number two, is that I have had to learn to live with and to live without. There are certain things that I could have gotten if I had gone that other way, but I am here in the cave of Adullam with nothing but my ears, waiting for the instruction of the Lord. That is my evidence number two. So I stand this day before the glory of the Lord. Is there any reason why I should not partake of the bread that is the Lord's? If we know the joy that is set before us, we will endure the ridicule. Jesus was ridiculed. He said, everything they did to me, they would do to you. In fact, there was a time they blindfolded Jesus and they slapped him. And they said, since you're a prophet and you know things, tell us who slapped you. The Lord. That is the Lord. But the, 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 the ones that Satan sent with the doctrine of demons told us that everything has to be a bed of roses. In fact, one of the ways by which people say, oh, if you know you have heard God, oh, you're going to have peace. <laughs> <laughs> How much peace did Jesus have in the garden of Gethsemane? The Bible says he prayed and he was sweating and his sweat became as thick as blood. He was troubled within him. And that was when he declared what the Lord had said. We have been told to be pleasure seekers. But thank God for what he is doing in the earth. The Lord is raising for himself his preserved remnant. And they are the ones that will partake of the bread that has been consecrated to the Lord. Let me tell you, the bread that has been consecrated to the Lord includes the earth. The earth is holy. It doesn't matter what anybody says out there. They can tell you they need to burn down more trees because the earth is getting polluted. Please do not listen to them. Listen to what the Lord said to Moses. He says, the ground upon which you stand is holy. The ground is holy and is a holy consecration unto the Lord and it will be yours but you need to learn how to be without man's approval. In fact, worse still, you need to learn how to be with their disapproval and contamination because that is how you receive the mercy of God. For everyone who has been made subject to the judgment and the castigation of the world, I put it to you today that in the mighty name of Jesus, if you would not give up, you will reap, and what you will reap will be a harvest of God's commendation. Hold on to the profession of your faith. Do not let the world determine if you have heard from God or not. Don't let others tell you. And you know them. You know that even them in their own walk with the Lord, they are neither in nor out. And you will not allow for them to, to challenge your position in God, to tell you that God is not with you, that if God is, is, if God is with you, bro, things will be better than that. Okay, go and look at the people that God was with in the Bible. In fact, some of them, things were good for them until God came to be with them. Remember what Paul said. Paul said, I was rich before I started preaching the gospel. He said, for the sake of the gospel, I have become poor. He had the accolades of men, the approval of the community, of the society rather. He had the approval of the high priest to the point of getting away with murder. But the moment he became a believer, even the ones who were supposed to be part of the ecclesia, they were like, we don't want to have anything to do with this murderer. He lost everything. It was so bad, he had to go to Arabia for three years. Think about it. That's what I tell people. You can't be a celebrity who is on top of your game and then you get born again and you just want to stay at that level. You just like you were an unbelieving rapper and now you want to be an apostle to the church. That's not how it works. You cannot just keep hopping from the top of one pinnacle to another pinnacle. That was what Jesus was offering, was being offered by Satan. He took him to a very high place. And it was like, just hop from this one to the top of the temple, right? He took him to a, to a high place and then to the pinnacle of the temple. No, you have to come down to the valley, first of all. Paul was at the top of his game. He was a celebrity persecutor and lawyer. He, was, he, was a, he had the equivalent of a PhD at law. And he came down from there to having to learn from the ones who were unlearned men like Peter. And he had to go back to school under the Holy Spirit for three years before he started walking his way up in the things of the kingdom. But we have been so carried away in our hearts 
after the idols of this world that once a celebrity just says now that they have, they have changed their minds, then we just accept them. No, I'm happy for you, but I want to see the fruits of repentance. The fruits of repentance look like renouncing all of what you gained in the world and now count them as dung. And then if you come into Christ and are ready to take one line upon the line and one precept upon the precept with no foreign label in your name, then I will know that you are a fruit bearer and one that is worthy to be followed and heard. Like I told you, this is not popular. People don't like to hear stuff like this because we love our celebrities too much. You can't just, let me tell you something. You, if you can't find an example in scripture, then you already know what you're dealing with. You're dealing with deception. Let's read one more scripture and then we're going to break bread. Maybe after reading this scripture, we will, let's go to Nehemiah chapter 3 verse 2. We'll do a quick summary. And then uh, Charles will come and give his testimony very quickly. We'll take up the offering and we'll be out of here. I guarantee you we should be out of here today. Praise the Lord. Nehemiah chapter 3 verse 2, the Bible says, Next to Eliashib, Eliashib, the men of Jericho built. And next to them, so actually, sorry, it's 2 verse 3. Nehemiah chapter 2 verse 3. Let's read from verse 2. Therefore the king said to me, Why is your face sad since you are not sick? This is nothing but sorrow of heart. So I became dreadfully afraid and said to the king, may the king live forever. Why should my face not be sad when the city, the place of my father's tombs, lies in waste and its gates are burned with fire? I want to say this to you folks, that one of the best ways by which we gallantly obey or we condition ourselves, or let me put it correctly, the, one of the ways by which we are prepared to obey what God says and to do it joyfully is if we have proper heads up, if we know what we're dealing with, okay? It is important for us to know what's ahead of us because if we don't, there is no guarantee that you will not change your mind along the way if it suddenly just jumps out in your face. Take Jesus' example, Jesus' case as an example. When he saw how painful it will be to go through with the rituals of the crucifixion, he was like, man, let's, let's not do this. I wish this cup will pass over me. But immediately he quickly said, Lord, not my will, but yours be done. Because you know he's the word of God. If he said that and he just allowed for it to continue to blow, that's what would have happened. Immediately he says, Lord, no, no, not my will, but yours be done. And afterwards, what did he say? He said, the son of man goes as it's written of him in the volume of the books. It's not a coincidence that Saturday last week, before that Tuesday message, I I read to us, or maybe the meeting before that, from Psalms 139 to let you know that all your days are written already by God, even while you were still being formed. So that you know that none of these things are coincidental or accidental. But the fact that God has written it is not all you need. You also need to know what he has written. You need to know the condition of the place that is asking you to go so that you set your expectations correctly for work as opposed to be for pleasure. Nehemiah described here where he was going. He knew that the Lord was calling him to come out from under the king to go and build. And he's going to build with men that have been rejected and men that are about to be ridiculed. He knew that that place was laying or was in ruins. If he didn't know and he just got there, his preparations would have been inadequate. And even if he had made some preparation, his heart may have failed simply because he did not prepare himself to his very core. The reason why I am standing here by the grace of God is to help us prepare for what the Lord is doing. Many of us, in the near future, the enemy may suggest to us to go back up to where we were in our understanding of the things of God, 
and in our relationships with people that have chosen to seek pleasure rather than to seek God. And when that time comes, you should be able to look the enemy in the eye and say, get thee behind me, O Satan, because I've already left all and I am not going back. I am not turning back unto perdition. For the Bible says, whoever turns back, Jesus says, my soul has no pleasure in him. And the apostle says, we are not of the company of them that turn back unto perdition, but we are of them that press forward unto the saving of the souls, of our souls. We need to know that no matter what it is, we are not to turn back because they have nothing to offer us. Even though it looks like we're leaving Egypt for the wilderness. Why am I saying this? Because I'm, I'm saying this also because of this. When the Lord began to show these things to me, it was literally like the Exodus. I could see people leaving what they have become accustomed to and what they have always, always, always known. Okay, thank you, Jesus. This is the time that I need to tell you this. Everything that I'm telling you is going to happen in multiple dimensions. Some of us is in our thinking. We have to shift. Some of us is actually where we live. We have to shift. Some of us is how we live. We have to shift. Some of us is the things that we do for, for daily bread. It has to shift. You see, because the Lord is telling us that there needs to be a repositioning for there to be a visitation. So when that time comes, judge with a righteous judgment. Know that you shouldn't put too much premium on what people will think. Don't put premium on, you see, because some people will be like, man, Kenyatta, I don't think you should live in that part of town. Man, Chris, I think you should work somewhere else. Oh, this and that. People have their own opinions. And when you say no, that you want to follow the Lord, then they will condemn you. Because that's what they do. They default toward condemnation. Instead of finding out why is Ron doing what he's doing? No, because the, the Bible says the prince of this world has dulled their hearts and blinded their faces. And so they're not going to be curious. They will just condemn you. So be happy with the condemnation because it announces that you are taking your place on the tower. The Lord wants to robe you as a priest in his house and he wants to position you as a watchman on the tower. And when all of those things in, Je in Nehemiah chapter 7 verses 1 through three, and, the, and part of four begins to happen, mainly one, two, three, you will remember that, wait a minute, the reason why they're ridiculing me is because I am now taking my place. So they no longer approve of me. That means I'm no longer one of them. Oh, praise the Lord. <laughs> Hallelujah. So we're going to come around now and break bread. And I won't labor us with any more scripture today, any more scripture reading, but I will still tell us what the word of God is. You see, Jesus says in Revelation chapter 3, verse 20, he says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. Whosoever would open the door and, come, and, and, and let me in, I will sup with him and he with me. Hmm. Jesus says, I will sup with him and he with me. Many of us, we stop at Jesus supping with us. Chris, Jesus is saying, I'm at the door of your house. I'm coming, I'm knocking. If I, I repent, let us read it. Revelations 3.20. And this will be it, Charles, if you want to be close to the front so that it doesn't take you sprinting to get up here, that will be great. Revelations chapter 3, verse 20. Jesus says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come to him and dine with him and him and what? He with me. I, I hope Tuesday is a more exciting message. And don't, don't take your money back. This is still good preaching. Because... What I'm about to tell you now is that many of us have had a one-sided expectation of the Lord Jesus. It says, if you open the door, Chris, I will come 
and dine with you. But did he stop there? For, for, for many of us, that's where we keep stopping. That, oh, I just want to open the door of my heart and Jesus will come and eat with me and he's going to stay with me and he's going to be happily ever after. Uh, no. He says, I'm going to come and eat with you and then you, you have to come and eat with me. Jesus has come to eat with you. He's been nice and dandy. But now you have to come and eat with him. <laughs> you see, there is power in knowing the truth. There is power in siding with the Lord. There is power in saying no to the world. Jesus brought bread to the 4,000. They all ate and they were happy. Until he said it was time for them to come and eat with him. And they were like, no, that's too much. We don't want your kind of bread. We don't want your kind of wine. That is the reason why he said, as often as you have the opportunity, do this in remembrance of me. Eat of my flesh, drink of my blood. Because this is his invitation for you to come out from your home, your comfort zone. To be ready to go into the cleft of the rock with him where he stays. You need to be ready to go to the mountains where he lives. You need to be ready to crawl and to climb. You need to be ready to bleed if you must. You need to be ready to deny yourself. You need to be ready to shed every weight because for you to follow him, you cannot bring anything with you. Revelations 21, 22, when the Lord was describing to John what the new Jerusalem is going to look like, he said, this new heavenly Jerusalem that is built by my heavenly father, nothing of this world can come into it. You cannot bring anything of the world into where he is. So he has come to you with your mess and he wasn't judging you. When Jesus came to your house, Kenyatta, he saw that the picture on the wall wasn't hung properly. He wasn't calling it out because he didn't come to judge you. He came to dine with you. But when is your time to come to where he's at? That's when you get stripped. You have to lighten the load. Everybody that Jesus called, he had one requirement of them. Leave everything and follow me. I pray that you would allow the word of God that has come forth today to the body to condition your heart. You see, I do not take any joy in, in you. Um, I, I don't get any profit, so to speak, in you sharing these videos so that we can get views. But it is the joy of my heart that you will let others know that this is the word of the Lord unto the body. Not just to communion house. Because the Lord is asking us, he says, church, Ecclesia, as he would say. You see the old habits, right? I have come to you. Now come to me. And that is where many people are dropping the ball. Many are called. Few are chosen. And I told you what Jesus was saying. I didn't understand. I had to ask the Holy Spirit and he took me to a high place and he revealed to me. Not a high place like Satan takes you to. But the Holy Spirit took me to a place where I can see the perspective of God. And they said to me, the ones that choose Jesus are the ones that Jesus chooses. So when the Bible says many are called, but a few are chosen, the ones that are chosen are the ones who chose him. So will you choose to go with him in the days to come? As we receive of the Lord's body the day and drink of his blood, let there be genuine repentance. Let there be the washing away of sins. Let us truly deny ourselves of the pleasures that we have become accustomed to. Let us repent from the standards of the world that we are trying to bring into Adulam. Let us deprive ourselves of the things that we have approved of in the world that we're trying to bring into this camp of the Ecclesia. Let us be ready to let go. Let us be ready to strip ourselves into the Jordan we go to fulfill our righteousness. Let us be ready to let go and let God be glorified. Let us be ready. You see, ah, uh, let there be light and there was light. So let us be ready and we shall be ready. And we are made ready by the word of the Lord. The same word that is coming forth today is pure water. He's able to cleanse and purify. Huh. Purify my heart. 
Let it be as gold and precious silver, refined as fire. My heart's one desire is to be holy, set apart for you, Lord. I choose to be holy, set apart for you, my Lord, ready to do your will. We have been called to be set apart for the Master. It's all about the willingness to surrender. And the time is short too, so you're going to have to do things quickly. May we receive wisdom and understanding, even from the knowledge that has been shared with us of the word of the Lord today, as we eat of his body and drink of his blood. In Jesus' name, you may eat. He called the bread his body, the wine his blood that we may partake of him without further sacrifice. Let's eat and drink. Hallelujah. Sister Shirley, I'd love to pray for your grandson before you leave today. So after service, if you grab him and just find me, let's pray together. Father, we give you praise. <coughs> Charles, you will share your testimony on Tuesday. Our time is fast spent. Let Alan come and close us out. <coughs> This throat is not going to stop me from saying this one more thing. You know, Alan, you can come. Just come. Just come. Let's, um, let's be snappy about it. But I want to say this one more thing because I believe someone's going to need it. We need it for this week. Genesis chapter 1 verse 7. The Bible says, Thus God made the firmament and divided the waters which were under the firmament from the waters which were above the firmament, and it was so. There is a great separation that is coming. And I want you to ask. <coughs> ask personally on your own. And say, Lord, show me how to be above the firmament. There are things that God wants to show to you that no man can show to you. So this week, I beg of you, seek the Lord. Seek him, and you will find him. And I just want to pray for every single one of us. I, I want to in, encourage us to stand to our feet and give God thanks for the veil that is lifted. And on Tuesday... Remember that I told us that um, two of our employees in Nigeria were kidnapped by hoodlums. <coughs> and, um, and as soon as I heard, I inquired, no, I'm fine, thank you, I appreciate that. As soon as I heard, I inquired of the Holy Spirit what was going on. And I told you, he showed me our general manager, the most senior of the guys, I saw him come back to us. So as soon as I saw that, I told the men in the group, what did I say? I said, this is what the Lord has revealed to me. Even though the news that was reaching us was that they were killing people. And so I said, the Lord has shown it. So let's give God thanks and pray for the families so that their hearts will not fail them for fear. And so that was what we prayed. And by the grace of God, all of them were released back to us yesterday. <laughs> Praise the Lord. 
I don't mean to, I don't mean to gross anybody out. I know there are children in here, but they actually witnessed the execution of others while they were there. As I'm speaking to you, two of them that are our employees and one of them who works for one of our partners, or three of them, or the three people that were our people have been released. They're in the hospital recovering because for all those days, they give them no food. They give them cassava flakes just to give them enough energy to walk to the next bush. No water. They only drank from streams that they saw along the way. And these are men who are well-to-do. They've always drank, you know, bottled water. And so now they're in the hospital receiving treatment. No evil shall before them. You see, because the man that I saw, he came out victorious, dressed in white, as he presented himself to us. So they will make a full recovery. But many have not been so lucky, and I don't even think these guys were lucky. They were just favored by God. And what did I tell you about that experience? I said, if you are dealing with people who do not have the light of God's word, to make them themselves light, they will be a burden to you. Imagine how much of a burden I would have been to you and others if I was afraid. Imagine how much of a burden, how gruesome it would have been, but we had confidence in God. In fact, at some point, somebody made a comment, not even one person, a few people, but I heard of one in particular who made a comment and said, I don't think you guys are taking this thing seriously. <laughs> and I smiled because I'm like, the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they are mighty through God. God wants us to get to a place where it doesn't matter what is happening in the natural. Our confidence in God is never shaken. <laughs> Let me tell you something. God wants you to be dependable. And to be defend dependable, you have to be like Mount Zion that is not moved. So as we stand today, this is what the Lord would have me say to you. As you're standing here today physically, let it be that so you will stand as a watchman upon the tower. So you will stand so that none of the ones that the Lord has given to you shall be lost. You will stand in authority. You will stand in favor. You will stand in the power of God to put to shame the works of Satan. Having done all to stand, stand therefore. May you remain standing until he's coming in the mighty name of Jesus. God bless you. Be seated, Alan. Hallelujah. God is good. We're going to prepare to give tonight. I will share with us here the giving details. There's a technical difficulty with the slide, but that's okay. We have it here. If you need an envelope, our dear brother Kenyatta has it here. Amen. Let's give an obedience. Let's give cheerfully tonight to this ministry that the Lord has called us to. How much it has been a blessing to us, pouring out to us. <clears throat> God is good. If you'd like to give online, that'll be communion.house slash give, as well as cash app, dollar sign communion house, and PayPal at communion house. We'll give a few seconds just to <clears throat> prepare those offerings if you're giving online, if you need an envelope. <clears throat> Hallelujah. Lord, we thank you again for this time of fellowship, for your word that was ministered to us tonight, oh God. This time of encouragement, the charge even, oh Lord, to seek you this week especially seeking your face, knowing that you shall be found, O God. We give you praise in advance. We thank you for the testimonies that shall come forth of what we have beheld, O God, from the top, even as your prophet has declared it tonight. In our dreams, O God, in our day-to-day -day thoughts, Lord, and in our carrying going, Lord, experiencing you as we seek you, as we turn our face toward you, O God. Lord, we thank you for the grace to read and to pray, O God, to press into the midnight hour, O God, spending time with you. Lord, as we give thanks unto you, let these offerings be found pleasing in your sight. Let them be sweet-smelling, O God, giving in obedience, giving in cheer, pouring out what you've poured into us, 
through this ministry, through this house, being a blessing unto the body, O oh God, bringing edification to the body, knowing that you are the only one that brings increase, the only one that brings multiplication, O oh God. We declare that all glory and honor belong to you, and we all said, amen. Hallelujah. Let's celebrate the Lord. God is good. Thankful for this word tonight. Definitely one we want to let soak in throughout the week and, um, and just get down deep. We give God praise and let's look forward to those testimonies that have come forth. Let's be intent on making that time this week because we've been given the charge. The Lord is really ready to meet with us. Let's see his face and behold. Amen. Everyone have a great night.